Good morning, Stacy. Good morning, Rich. How are you? I'm doing all right, except for it's very strange and uncomfortable not being together in person. That's true. Uh, <laughs> it's back to the old COVID day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for quarantine days. For, the, uh, for those listening, uh, my family has uh, dealt with the sickness. We have been, as it were, down with the sickness. Oh, I was going to say so, that. <laughs> so, uh, in the interest of uh, safety and, and being wise, uh, we are doing this remotely today. And uh, it's never as much fun to do it remotely, but c'est la vie. We have to give the people what they want. <laughs> <laughs> The show must go on. Um, so it is. So yeah, we are, uh, and of course, that means my dogs will be barking in the background, so I apologize <laughs> for that. Uh, yeah, don't miss that. Um, but yeah, we are going to keep pressing forward here. Um, so as always, you know, if when we're doing uh, these remote podcasts, which are, are few and far between, thankfully, uh, I, you know, there might be a little connection disruptions if somebody's phone gets a text or you hear my dog barking or whatever. Uh, so I apologize for that in advance, but we are going to try to uh, push forward here as best we can. Indeed. Because so, we are the home of professional podcasting. That is true. Uh, so uh, let's get started. We we started, uh, or I'm sorry, we, we wrapped up last this past Sunday with uh, this kind of little mini-series on uh, Love Illustrated, and we've talked about uh, the... the we, well, we kind of ran the gamut with marriage, family, and sexuality, and this week was focused more so on family and, and children. Yes, you know, there's just absolutely no way we could uh, pack all the things that we really need right. to say on these topics into just a few weeks or, or just into a sermon. Uh, each of these topics, if we were going to do a topical sermon series, which I, I don't do very often, um, would would in themselves take up a series, but we are recognizing that they're interrelated concepts and, and really inseparable from one another. And that's part of the problem that we run into in our world and, and the moral revolution that we've experienced in uh, recent decades. And, and it, I mean, we're seeing this, the, the increase or, or the uh, acceleration of this revolution in recent years and even months. Uh, and, and, and the problem we run into is that we have separated these things. We have, we have sought to separate um, for our own agendas what God has designed and built together. And so when, we are, when we're talking about the concepts of, of marriage, sexuality, and family, to do, to, to do or to try to do any of those things apart from the connection to the whole uh, is really disastrous and has dire consequences. Right, and and as you said, I mean that's where <clears> we are. <throat> it's, yeah. it's undeniable that you know that's that's where we are now. But I think I talked a little bit about this last week um, when we were talking about sexuality. But I'm I'm doing a, a Bible reading plan, a, a year long Bible reading plan, and you know the I, obviously no surprise, along with sexuality, when you're reading these, uh, you know, reading the scriptures, and even I'm still in Genesis, I'm in, I'm in Genesis 35 now, but the with the, the sexuality and the marriage, obviously it goes through all these lineages of, of families, and this was the son of so-and-so, and this was the daughter of so-and-so, but the way that people got it wrong, <laughs> even back then, uh, I mean, there Absolutely. were incestual, incestual relationships, and, and uh, you know, I mean, the, the idea of a family, and, and I don't know if this is this has become an Americanized thing, I guess when, and maybe this is just because how I grew up in the time period in which I grew up, when I think of like the stereotypical American family, I think like my mind flashbacks to the 50s or something, sure. and you know, you have the, the dad coming home and hanging his hat on the, on the coat rack and, you know, Timmy and Judy sitting at the kitchen table or whatever. And, and I realized that that even that picture as Norman Rockwell ish, as it might seem, um, these, these images of perfect families that we might think in our heads aren't necessarily what the Bible says they should be because we don't know what's going on behind the curtain. Um, in most people's that's, families. Well, that's very true. Image is not necessarily reality at all. And we should realize that clearly in the social media age. Right. 
uh, yeah. So like I said, I think, you know, even from that, that standpoint of, uh, let's say a, a quote unquote perfect family or whatever you might have in your head for what that means. Uh, I think today we've gotten so far gone from that, that it's just, I mean, I don't even know where to begin when it comes to talking about that. <laughs> Well, I think I think the best place to begin is at the beginning, and and so when we when That's we usually good. talk about the the idea of family and you know this this perfect family concept or idyllic family uh, image that we have in our minds, um, even in that we tend to get it wrong because we focus on our human perspective and desire rather than God's intent, his design and purpose for family. And so when we when we go back to Genesis, go back to the to the creation account, what we see is that God built relationships into it. He built specifically the the coupling of the man and the woman, the sexual relationship that's a part of that, and the the progeny that flows from that, the the uh, the offspring, the children that come from that. And and God establishes these things not by command or law, but by just innate design, the way he created the world to be uh, so that we create family units. And that uh, that's the foundation of everything else. But more than our temporal existence, and, and that's a reality that, that we need to recognize, is that the... In a temporal sense, life works better when we get family right, when we get marriage right, right. sexuality right, family right, parenting. We do all of those things uh, God's way, then there is a benefit uh, in an earthly sense in that we have a more stable, more prosperous, uh, more uh, safer society. And, and when we see what happened throughout um, throughout the age of the church, uh, specifically if we go back to looking at, at Greco-Roman culture uh, during the early centuries, the the shift, the change that came uh, from the from the the pagan worldview uh, and the 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 more temporal driven uh, values that came from that, Christianity elevated the the role of women in society, the value of children in society, not by adding something new, but by essentially restoring uh, that which God had always built into the created order and commanded in, in his people Israel. And then when we see the value of life through the lens of Christ, that, that brought in a whole other level of understanding that was completely foreign to uh, to the Greco-Roman world. Now, over the over the centuries, over the generations, uh, we've had many places, many many ways of getting that wrong, uh, where we have uh, distorted and, and sometimes used the scripture uh, even to support lifestyles and worldviews that are opposite of of scripture uh, in twisting and distorting that. So we have. Uh, we've made idols of family, we've made idols of sexuality, we've made idols of, uh, if not marriage uh, proper, the the romantic relationship that that uh, that is the, the right, yeah. identifying principle there. And so when we when we see those things throughout history and throughout honestly throughout Christendom, we we've, we've gotten it wrong in a lot of ways. It shouldn't really be surprising uh, to us. And as we understand the the purpose that God or the purpose says that God builds into these things, it, it shouldn't surprise us that this is an area that Satan would attack over and over from early on. And so, you know, right out of the gate, we see, you know, the, the first story post-fall of, uh, of relationships going wrong uh, in Genesis is... Cain and Abel, right? So uh, from from the very immediacy of, of sin in Genesis 3, we see Adam and Eve starting to blame each other. So the, the relationship's breaking down because of sin. The very next generation, we see uh, Cain killing his brother Abel because of the sibling rivalry and jealousy. This, this is because of the presence of sin. Family existed before that, 
but the the discord and the the difficulty that we now see almost as axiomatic. I mean, we it, every television show, movie, story, you know, novel, song seems to deal with broken relationships uh, on a variety of levels. And you know, things. And the reason those the reason those things are so popular is because a lot of people can relate to them. Absolutely right. You know, and and that's not new. I mean, think of right. like Oedipus Rex. This is a seriously messed up. Uh, family in this Greek tragedy, and, and as we look at at how this all plays out, the devil really wants to mess us up in in relationships, and especially in church relationships, and especially in family relationships, because this is where we see our relationship with God portrayed so clearly. So as we look at you know this just this third installment of our Love Illustrated uh, mini-series we were doing here, um, we were observing on Sunday that God illustrates his ongoing agenda of redeeming love in the context of family. And so family gives us a really good picture of, of God's plan, his, his purpose, his uh, the nature of redeeming love. And when we look at the parent-child relationship, we see an illustration of God and his people, just as when we look at marriage and sexuality, we see an illustration of God and his people. Even in something as basic as as just the reality that that uh, in, in a marital sexual relationship, um, it's intended to be life-giving. And so the very act itself produces life. There's a, a creative element that goes along with that as a reflection of God's image in us. And, and so as we see this whole thing unfold, um, yeah, of course, if, if husbands and fathers in particular are representing the role of God uh, to his people, and the, the wives and children are representing the role of, of the church or God's people in response to him, then do you, can you see why strategically the enemy would want to wreck that? To, so that sure, yeah. if you grow up with a bad image of father, with a false image of father God, because your earthly father was absent or unfaithful or demanding or any number of distortions, uh, right. then it's going to be that much harder for us to understand and establish a trusting relationship with our perfect Heavenly Father. If that, right, and it's just a cycle that keeps continuing. Absolutely, and we, and we see it over and over and over throughout the millennia. Uh, it's not new. It's not you know anything that is, that is uh, you know, somehow novel today that, that we're seeing differently. Uh, it, it's, it's not some new epidemic. It is something that has been... Uh, been from the beginning, like you said, you know, you see right. it even in those early stories in Genesis and in, in, in primeval history before um, the establishment of Israel, and then throughout the history of Israel, and then after Israel, and, and throughout the Gentile nations outside of God's people, uh, we we see the disaster and the destruction that comes when we get it wrong, when we do it our way instead of God's way. Uh, right. Even for those who don't have the commands, don't have the teachings about it, uh, but it's still built in. It's hardwired into humanity, into the 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 very nature of creation. And so, you know, as just in the same way that we talked about um, with with marriage and sexuality, and you know, sexuality in particular, uh, sometimes we get. Um, really caught up in, in this idea that, oh my goodness, it's worse now than it's ever been before. And, and that's just not historically very accurate. Um, but it is perhaps in our society, maybe our society has reached a darker place than what we might recognize in our lifetimes. It's Although, also in our face more. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably... Thanks to social media. And yeah, that's probably as much of an issue as anything. Um, because even looking back, you know, to my childhood, and, and as we all know, I'm I'm getting to be just so old now. Anyway, as we look back, you know, into the middle of the 20th century, so much of what we're dealing with today was already in upheaval at that time, uh, but it was more uh, in the shadows. It was lurking, uh, not so much being broadcast in the streets the way it is today. So, anyway, the the reality is. Every sexual deviance that you can think of, every messed up family situation that you can think of, 
already existed way back in Genesis. I mean, that that's, it goes way back to there. Uh, you, I think last time alluded to or, or referred to um, Sodom and Gomorrah and, and what right. went on with Lot and the two angelic visitors that he received and, and the horrific stories that, that go on there. So, so sexual deviance isn't new. Sexual immorality isn't new. Broken families aren't new. Um, but what what seems to be a renewed focus, and I don't think this is new either, but but this is uh, what we're what we're really seeing as the focus, is not so much the immorality, but the undermining of God's authority. And so today we see in the church, uh, unfortunately, and when I say in the church, I'm using that term broadly, loosely, uh, as the visible. Um, establishment that that is identified with the church, not necessarily with with true believers. But we have people who are uh, in the position, in the role of pastor or bishop or or spiritual leader, um, who are promoting ungodliness in regards to marriage, sexuality, and family, uh, promoting the idea that, well, you know, God's word can't really mean what it said, or, you know, it's not really for today. We need to let it grow and, and live as this living document and so on. You can't really take it literally. I think that's really the devil's end game is let's right. let's try to get to where what God has revealed as truth is no longer accepted as truth. And when we can begin to distort God's revelation of truth, then we distort God's revelation of himself. And then we undermine everything about our understanding of who he is. And we can't have a relationship with someone we don't know. So if, if right. the devil it can get people who represent, uh, at least uh, plausibly represent in the minds of people, um, God and, and uh, eternal truth, and to do that in an inadequate or distorted, blasphemous way, then, uh, then that, that corruption of, of the human race is amplified and accelerated. And so uh, getting getting that stuff wrong really, uh, get, th- this is so foundational uh, that that it's, it's crucial for us to recognize. So anyway, we, we focused in a little bit this week on the idea that, that out, growing out of the concepts of marriage and sexuality is the concept uh, of family. And specifically, when we say that, we're speaking of children and parenting that, that come out of it. And so the family unit is, is central. It's crucial. It's foundational. Uh, and we, we looked at our memory verse from Psalm 127.3 that I was uh, working on with my daughter this morning, and we were kind of talking through it. It's an easy one to memorize, but we want to make sure that we grasp the truth of it, that children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. And when we when we see children not as a burden, uh, not as the you know the unfortunate uh, possible consequence uh, of our sexual relations that we need to avoid or control, but as as a holy and precious thing that that God is giving life through these relationships, then then that sh- begins to shift a number of things. First off, we we. We value life differently when we see children uh, as a heritage, a blessing, uh, a reward from God, a gift that that should be cherished rather than uh, rather than something that should be avoided or or fit in around our other more important agendas. You know, I I, I don't want to have children because I got to build my career, and we're seeing that uh, sociologically that that. Uh, more and more couples are choosing not to have children or to have children much, much later uh, because we want to get our stuff in first. So we want to we want to get our our personal agenda taken care of. I want to make sure I build up my you know my nest egg. I want to have the career that I want. Um, both uh, husband and wife uh, trying to establish a career, uh, and that. You know, it sounds really super old-fashioned and stodgy for me to even suggest that that there might be another path. That having uh, a single income uh, in a, in a two-parent household, having single income uh, or or single career path, that's just unthinkable in in today's world. Uh, so, 
it even throws off things like the statistics. When we talk about unemployment and, and things in our society, uh, the numbers don't line up appropriately with what we saw in previous generations because right. now we're expecting uh, two people in a marriage to be working full time uh, or close to full time. And that has not been the case in previous generations. So, you know, just from a sociological perspective, things have shifted. It's it's a different dynamic. And what in the 70s, uh, people fought for the right to, you know, for women to be seen equally in, in the career world, um, now it's a, an expectation, almost a demand. Uh, and I, I've I've heard uh, young men and unfortunately older men too, uh, you know, demanding that their wife pull her weight by having a job. If she's if she's not bringing in income, she's not pulling her weight, which is as horrifically sexist as as it ever was back in the day when a wife was expected not to work. It's the same horrific chauvinistic sexism only now it's uh more yeah it's a different direction so now uh you know rather than demanding that she be home to take care of me and my family now it's demanding that she go out into the workplace to take care of me and my family so right. the, the and for in many cases also be home to take care of me well that's exactly right you know that that happens a lot so it, there's there's so many ways for us to get it wrong and, and so so few ways for us to get it right. And the way for us to get it right is to begin to see family through God's purposes. And so it's not ultimately so that we can have the, the house and the yard and the dog and the cat and the kids and, and have this happy, uh, you know, idyllic Norman Rockwell picture, uh, as you described earlier. It's ultimately so that we can teach and learn about God and his people. So that through the unit of the family, God is glorified and we are brought into relationship with him. So when we raise our children in the faith, we are putting them in a position, they still are, are making their own choices, but, uh, but we're putting them in a position where uh, it is, they have the advantage in being able to see God rightly and that helps stave off the attacks of the enemy. Uh, having grown up in a in a home where uh, my parents weren't first generation Christians, uh, you know my father was. He wasn't raised in a in a godly Christian home. My my mother was raised in a uh, Christian home that was unfortunately, um, like so many others in the culture, kind of torn between the church and the world. So they had one foot in the world, and uh, and holiness was not quite. Uh, uh, central to the family. So when my parents, my dad was a new believer, my mom was a, an immature believer, when they were raising us as children, the focus that my mom had in particular was that God has no grandchildren. You know, she, you, you don't get to be uh, part of God's family simply because you were born into our household. Uh, my faith is not going to get you there. We, we have to make sure that you understand uh, that uh, God created you for a relationship with him and you've been separated from him by your sin and and nobody gets a pass. You don't just you know get grandfathered into it, uh, but you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ uh, as your savior where, where you receive him. And when you receive Christ, he gives you the right to become children of God. And so that was, I don't ever remember a time in my life of not having that theme just throughout our, our household. And so uh, while there was a time when I remember uh, as a young child praying with, uh, with uh, Leon Clint was the fellow's name uh, at our vacation Bible school at church. And, and uh, his parents were a huge part of, of our, our um, children's ministry that shaped us. I don't ever remember even prior to that ever not knowing that God is a perfect heavenly father who loved me desperately when I did not deserve that love. And so the salvation that he offered in Christ was by grace. So those concepts were already there uh, before I was able to fully formulate them. 
because of the the groundwork my parents did, and and especially my mom. She was really, unfortunately, the spiritual leader in the family. My father wasn't there yet, and that didn't come until later on. Um, but to to have that development in us uh, as kids led to a foundation of, of understanding that we could then pass on to our children. And so then right. in raising our kids, I didn't ever want them, you know, <laughs> people make jokes about, you know, the pastor's kids and how hard it is to be a pastor's kid. Man, it was hard to be our kid before we were, before I was a pastor. That was the, the reality is if you are an outspoken Christian, period, people are going to have expectations of you. That's just right. how it is. And so they're going to wait for you to slip up too. They're right. going to be watching you like underneath a microscope. And honestly, if any of us are not experiencing that, then maybe we're not ex- we're not explicit enough in who we represent. Maybe maybe the world doesn't expect more from us because we haven't stood up to to be recognized as children of God. But uh, that's another podcast for another time. Sure. You know, but we wanted to make sure that our children understood that you don't have a different expectation because you're growing up in our home. Uh, everybody has this same expectation before God. You have different expectations from us because we know how we are raising you. But but what matters in our home is that we will serve the Lord, period. So while I love you, I adore you as my child, we stand for Christ, and as, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you're in this house, we will serve the Lord. Now, when you are on your own, you have to establish your own house. But we want to give them a reason to want to choose God. And we want to give them the understanding, the, the, uh, the ability to think biblically and Christianly. Because if we don't, then the world around us is bombarding them with ungodly thinking all the time. We can't just have the attitude of, I'm going to let my kids make their own decisions. Number one, they won't because the devil won't let them make their own decisions. Our will is bound over to sin. We need to be trained. We need to be taught the ways of God in order to be able to make those right decisions. Otherwise, our, our capacity for choosing is darkened by our sin. So by teaching our children, by, by yes, making them go to church, making them go to Sunday school, making them focus their priorities on the things of God, even when sometimes that's difficult and, and uncomfortable because the world around us doesn't have that same perspective, uh, they are learning a different way. And in learning that different way, and seeing the authenticity of Christian parents who not only proclaim Christ, but actually live that out authentically. You know, that uh, we're getting ready to look at, at the book of Ephesians. And, and one of the things I love about this as a cornerstone kind of book is the first half of Ephesians is all about who we are in Christ. And the second half is all about what that looks like. Because we have to have both. That's, you know, two of my favorite uh, books in the scripture are, are, are Romans and James. Romans lays out the theological uh, blueprint for how to be uh, Christ followers. And James is like, okay, let's not talk about it. Let's be about it. You know, it's a much more practical kind of thing. And we need both sides of that coin. So when our children see their parents prioritizing the things of the faith not taking them to church and dropping them off which uh, honestly that that happened in in our lives when i I was young Uh, my mother still regrets that to this day that that was part of who we were she would take us drop us off at sunday school and then she'd come back later so she you know wasn't a part of that but children you know our, our values are are generally more caught than taught so what we what we teach our children with our uh, proactive teaching is one thing, but what we demonstrate for them in the authenticity of our lives is another. If we want them right. to see Christ, we have to live for Christ in such a way that our words actually then make sense. Right. And uh, we're running out of time here. So I know that uh, there were a couple things on the, um, I don't have it in front of me, I should, the uh, outline you had on Sunday about the, you know some of the, the consequences of, of giving this wrong. Um, and so I, I wondered if you might touch on some of those real quick, because, you know, we can say whatever we want about, you know, how, how to do it and what yeah. you should be doing and how we should be doing it. But the reality is it's not just 
the Bible isn't just saying this just to say it. There are there are actual consequences, and we're seeing that play out every right. single day. Uh, but but actually having those words and, and visualizing it and recognizing these consequences that we are seeing every day as problems, I think that's that's important. So I wondered if you Absolutely. might go through a couple of those real quick. Well, yeah, as as we mentioned earlier, God illustrates his ongoing agenda of redeeming love in the context of family. Therefore, when we get family wrong, we are messing up this illustration, this picture of his agenda of redeeming love. So if we don't get this right, then our families in particular in our household are not going to have an accurate picture of of God's plan, his redeeming love. The people around us who are seeing our family are not going to have an accurate picture. So a couple of things leading up to the consequences. First, God made family the foundational unit of society, right? So that this is everything is built on that. Children are the purposeful fruit of marriage and sexuality. It's not an accident. It's God's intention. Uh, and, and therefore, we see that children are a heritage from the Lord and offspring are a reward from Him. Uh, secondly, we, we notice that God made the family the primary means of discipleship. And, and we see that in Israel, that God is saying, pass these things on to your children. You need to, to be able to answer their questions and teach them and lead them. So the main job of parenting is to lead our children to the Lord. That's that's what our, my number one job is not to get my kid the best education or, or promote them in sports or any of those kinds of things. Uh, my, my number one job is to get them to the foot of the cross and give them an understanding of who God is and a desire to want to be with him. So right. then uh, third, God made family a natural illustration of the gospel. So if that's the case, if if family relationships help us to understand both God and ourselves in seeing God's initiating love and our response to that, God's redemption is redeeming love toward us. When we're unfaithful, he remains faithful. The holiness of his love, that there is a standard, uh, there's discipline involved, um, and yet his love endures uh, beyond that. Then when we get all of that together, we have that that picture of God's agenda of redeeming love in the context of family. So if we're if we get it wrong, the consequences are, are pretty huge. First off, it distorts the image of God. If we if we get this idea of marriage, sexuality, family, all of this stuff, any of these places where we distort that picture, we distort the image of God. And that is at its root blasphemy. That that's what blasphemy is really is distorting the picture of who God is. So it does that. It undermines the fabric of society. If it's the foundational unit of society as God's designed it, then getting it wrong undermines, unravels the entire fabric of society. So we can try to redo it our own way and create society according to all of our education and, and secular worldview, uh, but it's never going to work the way it was designed because the designer made family as he planned it to be the foundational unit. If we get it wrong, it brings death instead of life. As we mentioned, you know, just the, the presence of, of conception as part of the marital act uh, is, is an indication. It's a reflection of the fact that God intends family to be life-giving, uh, to, to pass on his image to the next generation. When we get it wrong, these are the most damaging relationships that we can possibly have when our parenting is wrong, when our sibling relationships are wrong. All of the, the, the weight that comes on family, when we get it wrong, it transfers from being life-giving to being death-giving, death-bringing. Uh, it, it creates an enmity with God when we're doing it our way instead of his way. And that's one of the judgments that he uh, says through the prophets toward his people Israel is they're, they're not handling marriage right. They're not being faithful to their wives. They're not raising godly offspring. And that sets them at odds with God and is part of the reason for their exile. Uh, it it keeps our children from Christ. If if family is a picture of the gospel, it's a it's an illustration of God's redeeming love for us, then getting that wrong is going to uh, put a wall up, a dividing wall between our children and God. It's going to make it harder for them to be able to, to find and receive the, the gift of grace that God is offering them. And 
beyond that, while it keeps our children from Christ, it's also going to keep a watching world from Christ. As we are illustrating uh, the beauty of God's holiness and the redemption that he offers through this this, uh, redeeming love agenda that he has, if we get marriage wrong and we are anything from from you know depraved to simply off-putting in our in our family relationships then our neighbors the world around us seeing that it's going to put a dividing wall up between them and God as well and make it harder for them to be able to find and receive the gospel so not good <laughs> not good yeah these are not small that we're talking right, right, about these right, are yeah. these are big things right and see i mean i don't want to just gloss over those i know we're out of time but it's important to understand the the impact of all of those things um absolutely and, uh, like like i said earlier you know uh we're living it so <laughs> right. recognizing recognizing those uh can hopefully uh i, I know at least in in my little two-person uh household here uh i think it's important for me as a parent to recognize those so i i to strive not to get it wrong even though i'm gonna mess up again and again and we are we're all going to to some extent get it imperfect because we're not god we are to be a reflection and sometimes there's a smudge on the mirror and we got to work hard to clean those smudges off so that the reflection can be more accurate right uh but we we will stop there we're a little bit over i'm surprised we went over on a phone conversation i'm impressed Well, we could go on for hours on this topic. And, you know, before we sign off, I do want to just because uh, tomorrow is the inauguration of the new president and because we have such a divided world, uh, you know, everybody's all crazy about uh, politics and and the weight of that. I just want to encourage everybody who's listening and and every Christ follower in particular, uh, man, we got to know that the real weight is not what happens in Washington, but what happens in my own household. And, and so this, you know, whether we have uh, a perfect president, which by the way, we have never and never will have a perfect president, uh, whether we have a president that reflects your values or not, um, this is an opportunity not for us to, to just say, oh, you know, oh no, this is ruining our, our country, it's ruining our lives, but to be able to, to use this as a teaching opportunity with our children to be able to think through not simply the politics of it or even the civic responsibilities that go along with being American citizens, but with our primary citizenship being in heaven, this is a chance for us to talk through the gospel, to talk through eternal things in a greater light as weightier and more important than these temporal things, no matter how big they seem. All right. We'll stop there. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Uh, I think that's important for everyone to hear right now too. Uh, Yeah, but we'll end it there for today. Hopefully next week we'll be back to our uh, normal, regular standard programming. Um, And yeah, I think that's all I have. I know you, I'm not even going to ask you if you have more because I know you do. <laughs> but uh, we will stop there for today. And So how can people reach out to us, Stacey? Oh, that's a good... See, I'm thrown off. My groove is thrown off. Um, you can send us an email <laughs> at somethingreal at reallifeonline.org. Or you can uh, leave us a message on Facebook or YouTube. Leave a YouTube comment. Or you can uh, leave us a voicemail at 269-756-RLCC. And even though... We are, you know, technically done with this little, like I said, mini series. Uh, if you do have questions or comments or want to have a discussion about anything that we've talked about over this past three weeks, uh, feel free to to send us a message somewhere about that. And I think that is all I have. So uh, unless you've got something else, Rich, I will sign off for today. You know, I always do, but I won't share it now. Okay. Thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you next time.